is at least five. These are all, e it's easy to write out what the sentence looks like. Um, but some properties which are not definable are things like uh, be graph being connected or three colorable or planar or having an even number of edges. And we'll, when we talk about Aaron Freud Frasse games, we'll talk a bit about how you establish these, these properties. Okay, so um, one, one um, early program of research in finite model theory, which was started by Gurevich and others in the 1980s, looked at the key key theorems in classical model theory and, sees, and, and to see what happens to those theorems when you restrict them to uh, finite structures. And so two of the central pillars of classical model theory, so the com compactness and completeness theorems fail, break down when restricted to finite structures. So let's just look at this quickly. So the compactness theorem says that if you have a theory or a T, a set of finite sentences, then T has a model if and only if every finite sub-theory Every finite subset of T has a model. And this fails on finite structures, which is easy to see by the following example. So uh, if, if T consists of the set of sentences saying there exist at least N elements in the universe, then every finite subset of T, finite set of such sentences, has a finite model, just any large enough finite set. But T itself has only infinite models. So this shows that compactness theorem fails on finite structures. Similarly, the completeness and incompleteness theorems of, of Gödel say that the set of first order tautologies, the set of first order sentences phi, such that phi holds for all structures A, including finite and infinite structures, uh, this set is recursively enumerable but not co -re. And interesting, it's interesting that on finite structures, the opposite holds. This is known as Trachtenbrot's theorem, that the set of finite tautologies is co -re but not re. So, that's another big difference between classical and finite model theory. And uh, maybe not surprisingly, uh, uh, nearly all of the classical theorems which rely on the compactness uh, principle turn out to fail uh, on finite structures. And this includes a large class of classical preservation, interpolation, amalgamation theorems. Um, and, um, but understanding exactly which classical theorems uh, fail on finite structures and which hold on finite structures turns out to be quite a delicate matter. So I'll give a quick example of this. Okay, so here are three of the uh, classical preservation theorems from, from classical model theory. So, um, so the first one, the, the Wojtarski theorem, says that uh, formula phi is preserved under injective homomorphisms if and only if phi is logically equivalent to an existential sentence. Um, so don't, don't worry about the, uh, I'm not going to go into any detail about these results, just, just want to uh, point something out. So don't, don't worry if the statement doesn't, doesn't make immediate sense to you. But uh, so a related theorem is Linden's theorem, which says something similar, but this time preservation under surjective homomorphisms is characterized in terms of being equivalent to a, a positive sentence, that is a, sen a first order sentence without negation. And then uh, a third theorem known as the homomorphism preservation theorem is sort of looks like the intersection of these two theorems. And it says that if phi is preserved under all homomorphisms, or if it's preserved under both injective and, sub and subjective homomorphisms, then it's equivalent to a sentence which is both uh, existential and positive. And uh, so, so these results are, are you know, uh, statements about the class of all structures, but if we restrict to just finite structures, then it turns out that the first two of these uh, theorems, the Wolstarsky theorem and Linden's theorem, turn out to fail on finite structures, and counterexamples were given by Tate in 1959 for the, for the first one, and um, later for Linden's theorem. But it turns out that the homomorphism preservation theorem, which, you know, looks very similar and looks almost like the intersection of these two, turns out to hold on finite structures. So, it's a, a bit of a, a delicate question which theorems hold and which ones fail. So this is one program of research in finite model theory. And, um, but one technique uh, which, which applies to both the infinite and finite settings is that of Ehrenfreud Frasse games. Okay, so that was a very, uh, very quick uh, overview of some of the differences between classical and finite model theory. And, and the rest of the talk will be substantially different. So if that went too fast, uh, you can, you can ignore it. Okay, so uh, 
now I'll, I'll go into a bit of detail about Aaron Freud Frasse games, and maybe I'll try to slow down a bit here. So, and, and please, again, now really feel free to interrupt me with questions if something's not clear. Okay, so, um, so an important parameter of, of uh, first order formulas is quantifier rank. So this is defined as the maximum nesting depth of quantifiers in a formula. So there's an inductive definition for this. Um, if we have atomic formula x equals y or r of x one to x, you know, r of some tuple of variables, this has quantifier rank zero. There's no quantifier. Uh, you know, negation and preserves quantifier rank and uh, you know disjunction and conjunction. You take the maximum and then quantification. You increases the quantifier rank by one. Okay. So, uh, so there's a notion of k equivalence of two for, of two uh, structures. So we'll say structures A and B are k equivalent uh, if they satisfy the same sentences uh, of quantifier rank k. Uh, so, and, and we denote by this uh, equiv sub k the uh, this is the notation for k equivalence. So um, one key property of, of this notion of k-equivalence is that for any fixed finite signature, there are only finitely many uh, k-equivalence classes. And uh, another nice property of k-equivalence is that it's a congruence with respect to a broad class of well-behaved structural operations, for instance, disjoint union or categorical product of two structures. So for example, a pfefferman vaught theorem says that if I have uh, two pairs of structures, A and A prime, which are k-equivalent, and another pair, B and B prime, which are k-equivalent, then the product of A and B is k-equivalent to the product of A prime and B prime. Um, okay, so uh, k-equivalence also gives us a kind of way of proving that a class of finite structures is not first order definable. So just an observation, if we have a class of finite structures C, then to show that it's not first order definable, it's necessary and sufficient to show that for every k, there exists a pair of finite k-equivalent structures A and B, such that A belongs to the class C and B does not belong to the class C. So this is a very useful necessary and sufficient condition for showing that some class is not first order definable. So to see why that is, we can look at the kind of contrapositive statement. So suppose that C is, is first order definable. So then there's some formula phi, which defines C. But this means that if we have structures A and B, which, which are equivalent for, you know, K equivalent, where K is the quantifier rank of that formula phi, then um, A belongs to C if and only if B belongs to C. Okay, anyway, this is uh, just a simple observation, but I'm going to make, make kind of implicit use of it. Okay, so the Aaron Freud Frasse game it gives us a way to characterize the, the quantifier rank you need in order to distinguish two structures in first order logic. And uh, this, was, this was introduced by, separately by Aaron Freud and Frasse in the uh, 1953, 1961. So, uh, okay, so uh, I, I, you've seen this already, but I'll tell you the, the definition of the game one more time. So the K round Aaron Freud Frasse game on a, on a pair of structures A and B has two players, which we call spoiler and duplicator, although there are other names in the literature, such as Samson and Delilah, are non-equivalent and, and equivalent players. But here I'll use spoiler and duplicator. So the duplicator wants to prove, to establish that A and B are K-equivalent, and the spoiler wants to refute that, the, that A and B are K-equivalent. So those are, the, those are their goals. So the way the game works is that in each of the, each of the K rounds of the game, First, the spoiler selects an element in either structure. So he selects a structure and an element in that structure. And then the duplicator selects an element in the other structure. And uh, so this continues for k rounds. And at, at the end of the game, after all k rounds, we have uh, you know, a sequence of k distinguished elements in A and a sequence of k distinguished elements in B. And we say that duplicator wins the game if and only if these these two k tuples of elements describe a partial isomorphism between the two structures. Okay, so that's the definition of the game, and I'll work through some concrete examples. So this will hopefully be very very clear later on. Okay, so 
the, the kind of key theorem about Ehrenfeld-Frasse games is the following. So the duplicator has a winning strategy. Oh, so by the way, this is a, you know, the, a zero-sum game, so you know, either spoiler or duplicator has a winning strategy for any given K and any given pair of structures A and B. So the, the duplicator has a winning strategy in the K-round Ehrenfeld-Frasse game on structures A and B if and only if A and B are K equivalent. So this is the key, key property of Ehrenfeld-Frasse game. And this, is, this has a straightforward proof by, by induction on formulas. And uh, there are similar games and variants of this game uh, which characterize uh, definability in other logics. Uh, okay, so now let's, let's look at some concrete examples of Ehrenfeld-Frasse games and to prove that certain classes of structures, of first-order structures, are not first-order definable. Okay, so the, the first example I want to look at is the class of even linear orders, of finite even linear orders. I want to show that this is not definable in first order logic. So a linear order is just a structure, and here I'm talking always about finite structures. So a finite set together with a linear order on that set. And by even, I just mean that there's an even number of elements. So the class of even linear orders is not first order definable. So how do you, how do you prove this using Ehrenfeld-Frasse games? Well, for, for an arbitrary uh, K, we show that we, can, we, we give an example of a pair of structures A and B, where A has even size, B has odd size, and yet these are K equivalent. So in other words, duplicator has a strategy in this game. So the structures we're going to use will let A be a linear order of size 2 to the K, and B will be a, structure, uh, a linear order of size 2 to the K plus 1. Okay? And we're going to give a, stra a winning strategy for duplicator in the K round game on this pair of structures. So, Let's, let's just see graphically how the, how the duplicator strategy looks. Uh, so here, here are the two structures, the two linear orders, and we can see that B has one more element than A does. So let's say in round one, Spoiler gets to pick which structure he plays in, and so Spoiler selects an element in one of these structures. And let's just say he picks this, this red uh, element in B below. So duplicator has to uh, select an element in the other structure. And what, what he'll do is he'll notice that this red element is closer to the left endpoint of B. So he'll match that distance to the left side. Okay? And in the round two of the game, spoiler again gets to pick one of these two structures and select an element. Let's say he plays this blue element in, in uh, structure A. So uh, this blue one is closer to to the red point then to the right end point of A. So uh, the duplicator will, will match that distance in, in the structure B. And now in round three of the game, maybe spoiler plays this green element, which is now closer to the right end point than to, the, than to its neighbor to the left. And so similarly, duplicator will match that distance on the right-hand side, and so on. Um, Okay, so through these five rounds of the game, we see that we have a partial isom you know, the, the, the pairs of pebbles that have been played in both structures give a partial isomorphism so far. So, so far, duplicator is winning this game through the first five rounds. But actually, at this point, the spoiler will win in the next round by playing this orange element uh, in the structure B, to which duplicator has no, no reply. So no matter which element of A he, 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 he colors orange, and of course, you can color the same el uh, element with multiple colors, but it, it won't be a partial isomorphism. So I hope this example visually illustrates kind of how, how duplicator can win for as long, a uh, you know, for a uh, certain number of rounds. So what can we say in general for these, uh, for pairs of, um, uh, so what can we say in general for this game when A and B have, uh, differ by one element. So, uh, so in general, duplicator can win the K round game, provided that both A and B have at least two to the K elements. So duplicator can win for log many rounds. And the winning strategy is just in round J of the game, we preserve distances up to, uh, up to two to the K minus J, okay? So you can write, write this out formally how it works, but I think it's, it's pretty clear, very simple example. Okay, now I want to use this, this uh, our result about even linear orders to um, 
show that the class of connected graphs is not first order definable. And this will illustrate another technique in model theory known as a first order interpretation. So the observation is for, uh, okay, so for a linear order A of size n, I'm going to define a, a graph G of A, okay, which will be a graph with the same vertex that is A, where the edge relation is we put an edge between uh, every two every two elements of, of distance two cyclically. So this, uh, let me just illustrate it here. So we've added purple edges here from uh, uh, guys at distance two apart, wrapping around. And so the observation is that if n is odd, then the graph G, G of A will be a single n cycle, a connected graph. And if n is even, this graph G, G of A will be a disjoint union of two cycles of size n over 2. So in other words, connectivity of the graph G of A uh, depends on the evenness of the graph A. Okay, so, so now here's our proof using this ob little observation of that the class of connected graphs is not first order definable. So for, for toward a contradiction, let's assume we have some formula phi which defines connectivity. We have some sentence which defines connectivity. So I'm going to define a, a different sentence, phi star, by replacing each subformula of the form edge. You know, there's an edge between x and y. So each of those atomic formulas in phi with, with uh, the formula which says that uh, either y has distance two from, you know, is, is x plus two or y is x minus two cyclically, okay, uh, in, this, in this linear order. So, so phi is a sentence in the language of graphs, but this phi star that we've translated it into is now a sentence about linear orders. And the observation is that, um, you know, the, the negation of this phi star uh, is defining evenness of the on the class of linear orders, which we showed, which we just showed previously is impossible. Okay, so, now, of course, one can also prove directly that connectivity of graphs is not first order definable using ehrenfreud frasse games, for example, on the pair of structures, you know, one, one n cycle versus the disjoint union of two n cycles. But uh, this reduction that we showed to, to non-definability of evenness of linear orders is, il illustrates this technique of interpretation. So I just wanted to mention that. Was this clear so far? I mean, this is all very elementary. Okay, so now I'm going to give a slightly more, um, uh, slightly more complicated example. Um, and this will lead to some more interesting result also. Okay, so now I want to consider a class of set, uh, structures which I'll call set power set structures. So I'll denote by set pow sub n the following structure. So the, the universe of the structure will consist of um, two what's known as sorts. So it will be a disjoint union of a set of, of atoms, which will be just integers 1 to n, and then as well as the set of all uh, sets of atoms, so the power set of, of, of this 1 to n. And there'll, be a, and there'll be a single binary relation. So there'll be two unary relations, atoms and sets, which name these two parts of our structure, and then a binary relation in, which just defines the uh, set membership. So I is in X in this relation, if and only if I is a member of X, uh, okay? So, um, okay, and, and so that's set power sub N. And in general, a, 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 a finite set power set structure is any structure which is isomorphic to, to set power sub N for some N. And we'll say that the structure is even or odd uh, according to the parity of N, so the, according to the number of atoms in the structure. Okay, so structure has atoms and sets, and then the, the set membership relation between those two sorts. Okay, so the, the first observation here is that the class of finite set power set structures is first order definable. Uh, and this is not completely obvious at first, because something which we can't simply say in first order logic is, is the top expression here. So that for every subset of atoms, there's some set which, which, you know, is, is uh, uh, you know, which has the property that for every atom, that atom belongs to the set, if and only if in of XS. Because, you know, this is not a proper first order formula because we've quantified overall subsets of atoms. So instead, the way you define this class of set power set structures um, is 
is the following. So first of all, we can, we can write a formula which expresses that the empty set belongs to this, to this set sort. Uh, and then we say the following, that for every set S and every atom, uh, the, the union of S and that extra atom is also belongs to the set sort. So this gives a closure property of the set of sets. Okay. And this formula is exploiting the fact that we're talking about finite structures in, in a rather essential way. So if, if, our, if, our, if, our, uh, if our sort of sets contains the empty set and it's closed under the property that if you have something and you add an element, you, get, you, know, you remain in, in, the, in the sort, then of course we contain every subset of, of atoms. Okay, so now the theorem I want to show you using Aaron Freud Frasset games is that the class of even set power sets, however, is not first order definable. So we, we can't define the set of the class of set power sets with an even number of atoms. Okay? And the way I'm going to show this is by considering again a pair of structures, A and B, where A is set power sub n and B is set power of n plus one. And I'm so, so one of those is even and one of them is odd. But I'm going to show that duplicator has a winning strategy in the, in the log n round Aaron Freud Frasset game. Okay? So this, this establishes that the set of set power sets is not first order definable. And again, I'm, I'm going to give, illustrate this strategy visually. Okay. So, so here's, here's, the, here's the picture of the structures A and B. So, you, we can see that A and B have the two sorts, the set of atoms and then some cloud of, of, of sets. And B has one extra element here, this, this, this kind of gray dot in the middle, okay? So we're gonna give a winning strategy for log n rounds. So let's, let's say that in, in, in the first round of the game, spoiler picks an element in the set sort of A, and it, it happens to be this set of four elements, okay? So what should, what should a spoiler's uh, reply be? What element of B should he play? Well, he'll play any, any set of four elements in B. Uh, and the key point is that four is less than half of, of, the, of the elements. Uh, so now in the next round of the game, let's say that spoiler plays this, this blue set. Uh, which contains three points, uh, and it intersects this red set in one point and has two other points. But now, you know, it's, it, uh, okay, so. Uh, so here, duplicator will play a kind of similar configuration uh, in, the, in the structure A. And so far, everything looks, looks nice because these two sets are both kind of small, contain fewer than half the elements. But now in the next round, let's say that spoiler moves back to the structure A and plays this green set which contains everything but two elements in A. So now instead of matching the size of this set exactly, we'll play something which matches the complement of this set. So we'll play everything but, but two points uh, in the structure B. And okay, so now let's say there's this yellow set we match and keeps going like this. Uh, so now at this point, um, we have two sets which differ by, you know, one has uh, two elements, one has three elements. And now we'll, spoiler, we'll start playing in the atom sort. And, okay, so at this point in the game so far, we have this partial isomorphism. But then in the next round, spoiler can win by playing this, this uh, blue point. And then duplicator has no reply. So, um, okay, I, I hope this, this illustrates the general principle behind the winning strategy. But, uh, so the kind of exercise is to show that you can, you can take the intuition here and, uh, and show formally that if A has n elements, B has n plus one elements, then, then duplicator really can win, can hold out for log n rounds. So uh, basically the, 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 what the property that um, duplicator tries to preserve uh, is that if you, you look at the sets which have been played, you look at all Boolean combinations of those sets in one structure and in the other structure, and you want to match the sizes of those up to some parameter which is decreasing by a factor of two as, as you go along in the game. So that's how you can make this formal. Okay, so, that, so we just showed that the set of even set power set structures is not first order definable. And now I'm going to give an application of this result uh, to 
to, to show something nice about uh, a variant of first order logic known as order invariant first order logic. Okay, so, um, so here's a definition. So we have a first order sentence phi, which involves some extra, some additional binary relation symbol, which, which, which is uh, supposed to be a linear order, okay? So we'll say that this sentence is order invariant if for every unordered finite structure A, so for every finite structure A without a linear order, if we take any two linear orders on A, then A with the, with the additional first linear order satisfies phi, if and only if A satisfies phi with addition to, you know, when we add the second linear order. So, um, in other words, a first, order sen you know, a first order sentence which speaks about an extra linear order is order invariant, if and only if it doesn't depend on the choice of order that you put on the, on the structure. Okay, so, uh, so we say that a, a class of C of finite structures is order invariantly definable, or it's definable in order invariant first order logic, if there exists some order invariant uh, sentence phi such that a, 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 a structure A, an unordered structure A belongs to C, if and only if A together with any, an arbitrary linear order on A belongs, um, models phi. Okay? Okay, so now uh, I want to show that the class of even set power set structures, which we, we, we just showed it's not first order definable, but I want to show now that in fact it's order invariantly first order definable. So it's the first order definable in order invariant first order logic. So we've already defined the set of all set power set structures in first order logic. So all we need to do is define the, the set of even ones within that class. And how do we do that if we're given some arbitrary linear order on the entire universe? So recall that you know, the universe of these structures is a disjoint union of, sorry, that where it says elements should be atoms. So of atoms and sets. So we have some linear order on this, but of course it induces by restriction a linear order on the set of atoms alone. Uh, so, but now to define evenness of the set of atoms, we can say the following. Um, basically, there exists some set which contains every other atom. So it contains the first atom, the minimal, uh, it contains the minimal um, atom according to this linear order. It does not contain the maximal atom in this linear order. And for every two consecutive atoms, it contains exactly one of them, okay? So, uh, okay, so this is something which can, will hold if and only if the number of atoms is uh, even, okay? So what we've, what we've shown is this result of, of Gurevich that uh, order invariant definability is more powerful than, than ordinary first order definability. So we've given an example which shows this. And uh, so this result has is kind of some application uh, to, to relational database theory. Um, so I'll mention this briefly. The, uh, so in, in database theory, uh, people of course consider relational database abstractly, but in fact, uh, any physical you know, Im, uh, implementation of a relational database will impose some extra relation on data, so for example, a linear order or some, or some successor relation. And a kind of question that arises is, well, is, is it possible to exploit this, this uh, extra structure in some query language like uh, SQL, which you can think of as being like first order logic, in some kind of representation independent fashion? So if you're going to make use of this, some, some extra linear order imposed on your data, well, you know, you'd, you'd want to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, since that's something which depends not on the database itself, but the representation, you, you, you want to make sure that you're not uh, uh, sensitive to the choice of linear order. So, so this, this question, you know, when you translate it into, what it, into the finite model theory language is, is precisely asking uh, if order invariant definability is more powerful than first order definability. So, uh, so if instead of order invariance, you could consider some other kind of uh, auxiliary relation and ask about invariance with respect to that. So one, uh, uh, one, one other question that people had asked is if, uh, what about invariance with respect to an auxiliary successor relation? And uh, some, uh, a result of mine is that uh, even successor invariant definability turns out to be more powerful than first order definability. And the counterexample 
uh, is kind of based on Gurevich's counterexample, but it has some extra ingredients. So it combines various, you know, uh, standard Aaron Freud Frasset games on set power sets, on long paths, on random graphs. So um, it's kind of a nice application of many different Aaron Freud Frasset games. Okay, so that that's the uh, concludes what I wanted to say about. Um, uh, Aaron Freud Frasset games. And now I'll move on to the, to the main part of the talk, which will be about uh, logic and random structures, so uh, zero one laws in particular. So the study of asymptotic properties of logical expressions is uh, one major area in finite model theory. Um, and so here I'll discuss, the, I'll, I'll give a proof of the, of the classic zero one law, and then I'll mention some connections to actually to, to computational complexity. Okay, so, um, uh, so I'm sure you're familiar, but the definition of erdos rainy random graph GNP is, uh, so this is a random graph with, ver you know, with n vertices, ver vertex at one to n, in which for every pair of vertices, we independently put it, connect them by an edge with probability P. So we flip some biased coin uh, independently for every pair of vertices and add an edge with probability P. And uh, so, in, in this talk, I'll consider two, uh, you know, two um, kind of versions of this. So the uniform random graph is where we, you know, each edge is included with probability one half. So this is denoted G n one half. And I'll also be mentioning some results which, which concern Erdos Radian random graphs G n P, where P looks like n to the minus alpha for some constant alpha between zero and one. Okay, so this is, these are particular model of sparse random graphs. Okay, so the, the classic uh, zero one law for first order logic, which is which was uh, proved independently by by Fagan uh, and also in, in Soviet Union. Um, so the zero one law uh, says that with respect to the uniform random graph G G n one half, for every first order sentence phi, if you look at the probability that G n one half satisfies phi, then that ha that tends to either to zero or to one. Okay, so every first order sentence holds, either holds asymptotically almost surely, or its negation holds asymptotically almost surely with respect to the random graph. Okay, and so I'm gonna give a proof of this. Um, so the, the proof of this uh, zero one law uses uh, the following graph property known as K extendability or the K extension property, which I'll denote by X sub K, okay? So this property says that for every set S of at most K minus one vertices and every subset of S, every subset T of S, we can find some vertex in the graph outside of S, which is adjacent to everything in T and non-adjacent to everything in S minus T. So, uh, so that's the statement. And uh, okay, so kind of just to illustrate this, for, for the, the four extension axiom says that for every three vertices, for instance, this, this red, yellow, and, and blue vertices, then for every subset of those vertices is witnessed by, uh, in, in terms of adjacency to some other uh, vertex in the graph. So for every three vertices, uh, we can find eight vertices where you know, one is not adjacent to anything, one is adjacent to all three, and for every subset we can, we can witness it. Okay, so, um, so that's x sub k. So, um, so the first lemma about this k, k extendability is that if, if we have two graphs, g and h, which are both k extendable, then they're k equivalent. They satisfy the same first order sentences up to quantifier rank k. And this is something we can show very easily by considering the Aaron Freud Frasset game. Um, so what we have to do is take, take two k extendable graphs, g and h, and give a winning strategy for duplicator in the k round game. And this is, this is uh, extremely simple. Uh, because all we, all we need to do is d just match partial isomorphism in each round. So, um, you know, if, 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 if spoiler plays some yellow element which has an edge, then we can find an, a yellow element which has an edge. And similarly, if he plays a blue element which has an edge only to the yellow and not to the red, well then there exists uh, a, uh, some blue element which has an, you know, is adjacent only to the yellow and not to the red, simply by, by this k extendability, and, and so on. And we can just match partial isomorphism for k rounds. Uh, okay, and now the second key lemma about this k extendability is that, uh, well, the, the uniform random graph g n one half is almost surely k extendable. 
Okay, so, so here's, here's the proof of it. Uh, so I'm going to look at the probability that a random graph gn one half is not k-extendable. I'm going to show that that tends to zero. Okay, so, so the, the event that g is not k-extendable is the, uh, you know, the, the union of events that g does not satisfy uh, the k-extension axiom with respect to some particular s and t in the definition. So we just use a simple union bound, and this is at most the sum over overall, overall S and T, right? So S is a set of size at most K, and T is a subset of S. That G does not satisfy the K extension property with respect to that S and T. Okay, and, and, and just what that, what that literally means is that, uh, it, that for, for every X, which is not outside of the set S, that I, uh, either X has an edge to something which is in S minus T, or or it's non-adjacent to something in T, okay? But uh, by independence, that probability is, looks like a one half to the n minus k, exactly. And the number of such pairs S and T is at most n to the k times two to the k, something like that. So, so we get a bound of the form, something like four n k over two to the n. And for, since k is fixed, this goes, to z, this goes to zero as n grows, okay? So we've proved that uh, almost surely, G is K extendable. Okay, and now this gives us our a proof of the uh, zero one law. So um, uh, I'm going to give a slightly different statement actually of, of the zero one law. So so the, the the zero one law here that I stated before says for every phi first order sentence phi, its its limiting probability is either zero or one. But we can actually look at there's a kind of equivalent formulation of this in terms of two independent random graphs, G and H. So the zero one law, I claim, is equivalent to the following statement, that for every first order formula phi, almost surely G satisfies phi if and only if H satisfies phi. So talking about two independent uh, uniform random graphs. And uh, yeah, th this, this follows formally because you know, if you look at the probability that G satisfies phi if and only if H satisfies phi, this is the probability that G satisfies phi squared plus one minus probability that G uh, satisfies phi squared. And if this, you know, tends to zero or one, and then this one tends to one. Okay, so here's the proof now of the zero one law. So, okay, let K be the quantifier rank of our sentence phi. Uh, and take two independent random graphs, G and H. Uh, so almost surely they're both K extendable. Uh, therefore, they're K equivalent. And therefore, one satisfies phi if and only if the other satisfies phi. Okay, so this proves the, the you know, the, the equivalent statement of our zero one law. Is that clear? Okay. So now I'm going to talk about some some um, some other zero one laws. Uh, just just mention them, not going into any proofs. So uh, a very a very interesting, beautiful result of Shayla and Spencer gives a zero one law for first order logic with respect to the random graph g n n to the minus alpha, uh, where alpha is any irrational number uh, between zero and one. Um, and he, here it's actually essential that alpha is irrational. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, so, this, so first order logic has a zero one law for such graphs. Uh, Another very, very, very interesting uh, result, which is not a zero one law, but is known as a convergence law, uh, is for first order logic with respect to a random unary function. So, so here we consider structures consisting of some finite set and a random unary function on that set. And this is a, this, this is a result due to Lynch. So for every first order sentence phi in the language of unary functions, there's, there's some real number C, some limit between zero and one, such that the probability that, for, that a random unary function on n elements satisfies phi tends to that C. And moreover, the limiting probability C is, is an expression that you can write, uh, write down using integer, you know, constants and uh, operations plus times divides and x. Um, Okay, but there are, there are other settings where uh, we can say that there's, in fact, no zero one law and not even any convergence law. Um, so first of all, if we look at, instead of just random graph, where, where, where the only relation is adjacency, but let's say we look at 
random graphs, ordered random graphs, so random graph together with a linear order, then clearly the first order logic has no zero one law because we can express the sentence, you know, we can express that there exists an edge between the first and second vertices in this linear order. So that has limit probability one half. Um, but we can ask, well, but maybe there's some convergence law still. So maybe there's some limit probability for every sentence. And uh, in fact, that's, uh, that's not the case. Uh, so there exists a first order sentence in the language of ordered graphs such that the probability that an that a n-vertex uh, ordered graph uh, satisfies phi does not converge. And uh, similarly, if we look at a, 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 rational, uh, a rational number alpha between 0 and 1, then, then there's a first order sentence in the language of, of, of unordered graphs such that g and n to the minus alpha, uh, the limit probability that that satisfies, uh, sorry, the probability that that satisfies phi does not converge. And uh, similarly, if we look at instead of random unary function, but if we look at a random binary function, then again, the, the, we have a non-convergence. There's no convergence law. And each of these counterexamples has something in common, which is that they, they show that you can, in such random structures, uh, with high probability, you can interpret some very small initial segment of, of uh, arithmetic, and then say, and then which lets you somehow speak about the size of the structure. So that's how you get some, some non-convergence. Okay, so uh, now I want to mention a, a, an interesting open question. Uh, so I already defined for you the order invariant first order logic. So very interesting open question is whether this logic has a zero one law. Um, so that's that's a okay. So n now let me discuss a different kind of convergence law. Um, so. Uh, so now I'm going to look at a, uh, an extension of first order logic uh, by a, what's known as a parity quantifier, mod 2 quantifier. So the way the mod 2 quantifier works is that for a formula phi with, a, with a, some free variable x, then we can form a formula of the form mod 2x of, of phi. So this expresses that phi of x holds for an even number of x, okay? So this logic is, is only well defined on finite structures, but so this is an extension of first order logic by mod two quantifier. And a very nice recent result of uh, Colitis and Coparty gives uh, what's called a modular convergence law for this logic, uh, FO parity. So the, the modular convergence law says that for every first order sentence phi in this law in, in FO mod two, there exist two constants, a sub zero and a sub one, such that the limit probability, so, uh, you know, the probability that g n one half satisfies phi, as you take lar you know, a large even integer n, tends to a zero, and the probability for, for large odd numbers n tends to a one. So there's, so there's uh, you know, two, two, con uh, two limits. Uh, and this result uh, uh, actually holds for any mod p quantifier, for p being any prime. In, in which case you get p limiting probabilities, and uh, the proof is, is very nice because it takes it uh, combines uh, techniques from complexity theory and algebra uh, as, as well as logic. Um, so in particular, it involves approximation by low degree polynomials and the Gower's norm and quantifier elimination. So that's a very nice result. And one one um, open question um, coming out of that work is whether there exists a, a similar modular convergence law if rather than a mod mod uh, p quantifier for some prime p, if we have, for instance, a mod 6 quantifier or, or you know, um, you know or, for, or any composite number, or indeed any prime power is also open. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll, I think I'll, in, a, in a moment I'll talk about connections to, to circuit complexity, but, uh, you know, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, you know, there are open, open questions still about this uh, AC0 with mod 6 quantifiers, and in my mind, getting a, a result about first order logic with mod 6 quantifiers would, would potentially shed some, some, some light on uh, AC0 with mod 6 quantifiers. So I think it's a very interesting question. Okay, so now um, uh, I want to talk about correlated, you know, so, so some 
make an analogy between uh, zero one laws and actually complexity theory by talking about correlated pairs of random structures. So, uh, so in this slide, I've, this is a repeat of the previous slide where I'm giving the zero one law, the two formulations I had of the zero one law. So when G and H were independent random structures, then the zero one law says that uh, almost surely G, you know, for every first order sentence phi, G satisfies phi if and only if H satisfies phi. Okay, so that's for independent random structures, G and H. And uh, in fact, it, it follows from this that we, 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 we get, in fact, uh, if, if we take G and H not to be independent random structures, but we're going to, to uh, take a correlated pair of random structures. So, so we're going to condition on G and H differing at exactly one edge. So the, the symmetric difference between the edge sets of G and H is exactly one. Um, even if we condition this way, then, then still for random, for any first order sentence phi, G satisfies phi if and only if H satisfies phi almost surely. So this I'll you know, refer to as a kind of correlated zero one law, and it just follows formally from the, from the previous thing. So that's for, um, that, that's talking about the language of unordered graphs. So now, Ah, it, it, it follows actually. For any constant, it, it also follows just uh, from this. Yeah. Um, okay, so, but now the question is, um, so what if we add some background relations now to, to our graphs G and H, so such as a linear order or, or arithmetic, then what happens to, these, to this zero one law, this correlated zero one law for, for such graphs? So, okay, so, so here's the question. So, uh, so now I'm going to add to the background of our graphs G and H, I'm going to add some arithmetic predicates, so plus, plus times in a linear order. And what happens to this zero one law, to this correlated zero one law? Well, you know, we already saw that the zero one law fails if you have a linear order, um, because you can, you can talk about, you know, is there an edge between first and second elements in the graph? But the, the amazing fact is that this, this correlated zero one law uh, turns out to hold if you if you have uh, arithmetic even if you have arithmetic in the background, and uh, and and in fact you know this this uh, correlated zero one law for random graphs with with uh, with uh, plus and times uh, is in fact uh, you know kind of hiding a, a statement about the circuit complexity, uh, and in fact it kind of directly implies that the parity is not in AC zero. So, uh, so, sorry? Ah, so, um, so, we ta so we're taking random graphs G and H conditioned on G and H differing at exactly one edge. So this is the symmetric difference between the edge set of G and edge set of H. Uh, or in other words, you can, you can first take a uniform random G and then pick a uniform random edge and flip it. To, that's how you get H. So the, the, first, the first two uh, statements here are just the, the zero one law that we saw before. So here we're talking about uh, independent random G and H. And uh, the point I'm making is that uh, the, the zero one law implies, directly implies this weaker statement, which is saying that if G and H are not independent, but, but uh, they differ at one edge, then, then still we have this, this kind of correlated version of zero one law. So then in the next slide, I'm saying, I'm looking at, um, G and H, but now I'm, I'm enriching the, I'm, a, I'm, I'm adding extra relations. So now we can also talk about uh, uh, plus times and a linear order on, on the universe of, this, of these random graphs. And then I'm making the point that the zero one law fails. So the zero one law is, is, becomes false. But this, this, uh, this weaker correlated zero one law continues to hold even if, we, even if we're allowed to talk about these background relations. Okay. No, this is this is for sex. This is this is a disguised version. This is literally equivalent to the statement that a, that uh, you know d log time uniform AC zero has average sensitivity uh, you know a little low of one. It's exactly equivalent. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to you know this way of explaining zero one law and, and, and correlated zero one law is my my own. You know, I guess, I guess so, so. I mean, I'm trying to draw some kind of analogy between the two things. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if it's, you know, I'm not claiming it's a particularly fruitful way of looking at this, but I think it's an interesting new, 
you know, you know, you could look at different degrees of correlation and, and, and try to, you know, try to bridge the, the gap. But, you know, anyway, I, I think there's some relation. Yeah. Okay, so, um, okay, so now in the last part of the talk, I'm going to, to describe some connections to, to circuit complexity. Okay, so this is the famous diagram from Immerman's uh, book on descriptive complexity. Okay, so, so, um, so as we heard uh, in, in the Nuge's talk, so descriptive complexity is concerned with the characterization of complexity classes using logic. And so the, the you know, the typical result in, in this field is that this Fagan's theorem that says that existential second order logic captures the complexity class NP. And uh, in this talk, I'm, I'm concerned with first order logic. And uh, there's a very nice uh, descriptive complexity characterization of first order logic in terms of the complexity class AC0, or constant depth polynomial size Boolean circuits. Okay, so let me, let me uh, just give the definition of Boolean circuits. And uh, here, since I'm talking about properties of graphs, I'll be considering Boolean circuits which take n vertex graphs as inputs. So there'll be, you know, n choose two variables, you know, x sub i, j, which, which uh, you know, indicate the presence of an edge between vert vertices i and j. And then the circuit is built up out of um, and or not gates, where the and and or gates can have you know, unbounded fan in, so any number of wires coming in. And there'll be a single designated output gate. So every such uh, circuit computes um, a function from n vertex graphs to 0, 1, so some Boolean function. And uh, AC0 denotes the complexity class of, of languages recognized by constant depth polynomial size families of Boolean circuits. Okay, so the, the descriptive complexity result saying first order logic equals AC0 is, is, uh, uh, is the following uh, result. I, I, actually, maybe, maybe they're, this is kind of discovered independently by, by different people with slightly different formulations. But uh, um, so the result is that for, so for every first order formula phi, there's some constant depth uh, uh, Boolean circuit of polynomial size, which basically evaluates, you know, computes <coughs> whether phi is true or false, given some encoding of a, of a structure of size n. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go into, this is a bit, a bit hand wavy, the, the statement, but. Uh, okay, so the, as I was saying before, so this is, here I've just written that from, uh, from the last slide in the previous part, this kind of correlated zero one law for, for these structures. So as I said, this is, this is uh, you know, directly translates in, uh, via this descriptive complexity characterization into the statement that, you know, uh, every Boolean function in uniform AC0 has average sensitivity little o of n. Um, yeah, and so, so this implies parity is not an AC0, for instance. Okay, so uh, actually we can refine this, this, uh, this kind of characterization even further by looking at a, uh, relating the, the a certain parameter of Boolean f uh, of uh, first order formulas called width. Uh, so this corresponds to circuit size. I'll define it, I'll define width in the next slide, but, um, but uh, if you look at the, if you look at the, this construction, if you have a first order formula phi with width k, then, then the equivalent circuit you get will have size order of n to the k. Okay, so, so what is the width of a, ah, yeah. Ah, so in, yeah, uh, so in this, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so FO with bit is equivalent to FO with plus times and linear order, or even just plus times, it's all equivalent. So when I, you know, when I talk about uniform AC0, so, yeah, so, so, so the, so in fact, you know, there are versions of this equivalence for uniform AC0 or non-uniform AC0, but, uh, in fact, if you have uh, AC01 structures with a bit predicate, then this is giving you d log time uniform AC0. So that, yeah, but for, for this talk, actually, you know, for, for what I'm gonna talk about, actually, I'm, you know, non-uniform AC0, everything will apply to non-uniform AC0. Okay, so, so the width of a, of a first order formula um, is the maximum number of free variables uh, in any subformula. Okay, so uh, equivalently, a formula has width at most k, if and only if uh, it's equivalent via some renaming of the, of the variables to a formula which has 
at most k distinct variable symbols. And uh, here's an example of that. So consider the following uh, formula, which will be in the language of ordered graph. And it will say that there exists an increasing path of length five. Um, so the formula just says, well, there exists x1 and x2, where x1 is less than x2 and there's an edge. And there's an x3, which is greater than x2 and an edge to x2 and so on. So there's some increasing path of length five in, in the ordered graph. So I claim that this formula actually has width two. There are five variables, in, uh, but it has width two. And, and we can see this by uh, the fact that we're able to rename these variables in, you know, in order to have only, only two of them. Um, OK, anyway. So, so number of variables is, is also is the same thing as width. OK, and so I'll denote by uh, FO superscript K the uh, set of first order sentences of width at most k. So this is also known as the k variable fragment of first order logic. Because you can think of it as a class of formulas with at most k distinct variable names. And uh, so this, this gives a kind of stratification of first order logic, uh, which is known as the width or variable hierarchy. And uh, th there's a, a version of the ehrenfreud frasse game, which characterizes, uh, uh, you know, rank in this k variable fragment. Um, you know, this is often called the k pebble game. Um, so the basic question that, that, uh, that you know, people have considered uh, is over which classes of finite structures is this, this width hierarchy, this number of variables hierarchy, strict in terms of expressive power? So, uh, so just for example, if we're concerned with the class of all finite structures, then it's easy to see that the, that the width hierarchy is strict in terms of expressive power because the sentence, there exist at least k elements, you know, the universe has size at least k, is something we can express uh, with the, by a width k formula, by a formula with k variables, but not by a formula with, with smaller width. Uh, so, but if we look over the class of finite linear orders with, with no additional structure, then, uh, in fact, it's, it's easy to see that the hierarchy collapses to its two-variable fragment. So, in other words, every first-order sentence uh, in, on, on the class of finite linear orders is equivalent to a sentence which has only two variables. And actually, the previous example kind of showed this. That you can talk about how large a linear order is by, you know, just using two, recycling two variables. And uh, a, a, a much uh, a harder result shows that over the class of uh, linear, colored linear orders, or linear orders with, with some, any number of unary relations, um, the hierarchy collapses to its three variable fragment. And in fact, this holds both for finite colored linear orders and for the class of infinite colored linear orders. Uh, this is a result of uh, Poisson. And, uh, but one question uh, uh, along these lines, which had been open for a long time, is whether this hierarchy is strict on the class of finite ordered graphs. And uh, a, a, natural, a natural property to consider in trying to separate this variable is the property of whether, if there exists a k-click. Uh, because it's obvious how to define with a k-variable sentence uh, that there exists a k-click uh, in an ordered graph. But it's not clear how to do so uh, with fewer than k-variables, even if you have access to some linear order. And uh, if, so, you know, for, for, uh, for k equals two, uh, we, we, you know, we, one can prove explicitly that, uh, you know, two variables are insufficient to prove, to, to express that there exists a three-click. And this is something you can show explicitly by playing the two-pebble ehrenfreud frasse game on, on a suitable pair of ordered structures. Uh, for instance, if you take these two, you know, kind of complete binary tree with this, with this ordering, uh, and then we add an edge like this to, to make a, to make a three-click, a triangle in the, in the bottom graph, then you can show by taking large enough structures with only two variables, you know, you, you, the number of rounds you need to separate uh, these two for, for a spoiler to win this game is increasing. So that shows that three-click is not definable with uh, two variables on ordered graphs. But uh, this, was, this was basically the limit of well, no, what, what we know how to prove kind of using explicit ehrenfreud frasse game. Yeah, so order, ordered graph, I just mean, you know, there are two relations, uh, you know, an adjacency relation and a linear order. But, that, you know, we require the linear order to define the linear order. 
Um, okay, so um, okay, so the the so the result uh, that pertaining to this width hierarchy, uh, I'm going to give a statement which is kind of in the form of a, of a another like correlated version of a zero one law. So um, okay, so if we if we consider a random graph at the uh, GNP, where P is a threshold probability for the existence of k-clicks. So that is, uh, G can, G, this, this GNP contains a k-click with probability exactly one half. And it turns out that, for, that this threshold probability is of the form n to the minus alpha for some constant alpha. So we consider such a, a random graph G. And now we'll let H be, you know, this, the, the, the kind of correlated random structure. We'll take G and we'll uniformly plant a k-click somewhere on G. So this is a pair of structures where G has a k-click with probability one half, but H has a k-click with probability one. But uh, so uh, what I showed is that if you have a sentence phi of width at most k over four, then almost surely G, together with uh, you know uh, 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 even you know G satisfies phi if and only if H satisfies phi, even if you're allowed to talk about uh, you know or, uh, arithmetic on the on the vertices of G and H. So this is, a, okay, so I'm trying to make an analogy with other correlated zero one law before, but you know, here, uh, here this applies to not all first order sentences, but just first order sentences up to width k over four. Okay, so some, some corollaries of this result uh, are that, well, this shows in particular that k-click, the k-click property is not definable uh, with k over four variables on the class of ordered graphs. And in fact, this even holds in some kind of average case sense. So, uh, of course, this implies that the k over four variable fragment is less expressive than the k variable fragment of first order logic on the class of ordered graphs. So this shows that the hierarchy, the width hierarchy for ordered graphs does not, does, you know, is infinite. It doesn't collapse. Uh, and in fact, uh, a, a nice corollary of these results, which was, which was uh, pointed out to me by Neil Immerman, is that uh, the fact that the hierarchy doesn't collapse, in fact, implies that it's strict for ordered graphs. So for every k, there's some property of ordered graphs, which is uh, definable with k plus one uh, variables, but not with, not with k variables. Okay, so, uh, so this answers that question about, uh, you know, with hierarchy for ordered graphs. Uh, so I wanted to mention some, some upper bounds for this problem. Um, so, um, in fact, this, this k over four turns out to be tight uh, in the context of average case definability of k-click. Uh, so uh, Amano gave a first order sentence of width k over four plus some constant number of variables in the language of uh, graphs, in the language of graphs with ar arithmetic, uh, which almost surely defines the existence of a k-click for, for this random graph g at the threshold. And uh, a recent, recent result of, of mine, still unpublished, is that in fact, even with, if you only have a linear order, then still with k over four plus uh, constant many variables, you can almost surely define the presence of a k-click. Um, so that, 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 that kind of shows that the lower bound uh, is really tight for the k-click property. And I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, unlike the the you know, two pebble game before where you can give explicit examples of structures. Uh, this is actually um, using results in circuit complexity to prove a, really proving a lower bound about Boolean circuits and then using the descriptive complexity characterization of first order logic to, to, to obtain the result on uh, in log, in, uh, you know, in about first order logic. So the, the statement of the result in terms of circuits is simply that Boolean, constant depth Boolean circuits of size order of n to the k over four cannot solve k-click in the average case. And uh, uh, just to mention some, some things about this result. So this, this in fact holds not just for constant depth, but for depth up, up to depth uh, log of n over k squared log log n. And this is all really almost tight because if you could improve this to any depth order of log of n over log log n, then that would imply a separation of complexity classes uh, nc1 from np. And uh, this, this result is, uh, you know, breaks out of what had been known as a size depth trade-off, uh, which was a feature of previous uh, lower bounds for k-click on depth D circuits, which were not even average case lower bounds, but in the worst case. So what had been known previously is that 
uh, for depth D circuits, Boolean circuits, to define k click, you needed size uh, omega of n to some constant times k over D squared, so something like that. And the point being that the, these lower bounds degrade uh, very rapidly with the, with, the, with the depth, whereas the n to the k over 4 lower bound um, holds without any decay, but only up to a certain d. And somehow this, 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 led to, this answered some questions uh, in, in complexity theory and, and led to some kind of size hierarchy theorem for AC0. And just to mention, I'm not going to get into the proof at all, but just to mention some things about the proof. So the, these, the previous lower bounds for the k-click problem, as indeed many lower bounds for AC0 uh, properties, use a technique known as Hastad's uh, switching lemma. And they use these in a kind of conventional, conventional way. And you know, this is what leads to this, this undesirable dependence on the depth parameter d in the exponent of, of the lower bound. So, so in my proof, I'm using switching lemma. It does rely on switching lemma, but it's using it in a, in a very different way. And so there's some key new ingredients uh, in, in the proof. For instance, there's a new, a new notion of average sensitivity with respect to some kind of shape and, and you know, somehow we identify a class of bottleneck shapes, which is what, what's giving this k to the 4 lower bound. So uh, it looks like I'm finishing a little bit early, but I, I wanted to, uh, OK, so just here are some references you can look at to learn more about, about these subjects. Um, and finally, just let me just repeat the two open questions that I raised in the talk. Uh, so is there a 0, 1 law for order invariant first order logic? And the second question is, does this modular convergence law of uh, colitis and coparty hold for, for instance, first order logic with the mod 6 quantifier? So with that, thank you.